Mitch has this reputation as he's this hard ass, you know, right. and all of his little advisors that are around him, they have another podcast, they call it Ruthless. We're ruthless. <laughs> Mitch McConnell is tough. And it's like some fucking, you know, two bit reality show host and real estate guy starts calling his wife names and like, we'll see how tough he is. He's out just out there standing in front of the press. Well, I just got to do what I got to do. You know, yep. that's not ruthless. That's weak. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. We're here with a fan favorite, Professor Emeritus at the Naval War College. He's now a staff writer at The Atlantic and author of The Atlantic Daily Newsletter. That's a lot of writing. His books include The Death of Expertise, which has an updated and expanded edition. Lots of fodder for that coming in April. We're going to get our grump on. Tom, thank you for doing it. Hey, Tim. Good to be back with you. How are you? I'm, well, I'm fill, filled with like hellfire rage right now. And I spent most of yesterday afternoon doing something that I'd kind of retired from, which was just like quote, tr- quote, tweeting just ruthless Twitter bombs on the pathetic Quislings that have decided to get in line with Trump now that he's officially the nominee. And uh, I just kind of want to get out some of that rage with you today, if that's OK. I, I think it feels therapeutic. Rage yeah. is kind of my default setting um especially these days and uh i was i was right there with you so i i know exactly how you feel well we've got a long list we've got mitch we've got mike johnson we've got the anti-anti-conservative writer class maybe mitch again maybe katie porter we'll see but first i want to introduce you to, to my new friend his name's eric levine do you happen to see him uh on the tube yesterday this guy is a not. nikki haley he's a nikki haley donor and yep. uh, i was blindsided by a panel with him on msnbc yesterday uh, I was pretty mean to him. People can find that on the internet if they want. Um, but but rather than you know play a highlight reel of myself, I, I wanted to just kind of really get your dander up and make you listen to the arguments that he was making. Remember, this is a this is one of the normal Republicans. This is a Nikki Haley donor trying to determine what he's going to do in the general election. Let's play it. So I'm from the Reagan wing of the party. So one thing that's not going to happen is I'm not going to support Joe Biden. Mm. The world is on fire, the catastrophic surrender from Afghanistan, the unforgivable appeasement of Iran, the separating uh, f- uh, the United States from supporting Israel. Uh, these, are, these are horrible things. The spike and uh, explosion of anti-Semitism on the left. As an American Jew, I can't possibly vote Democrat. So Donald so- Trump, pull out of NATO, uh, support uh, Putin. Charlottesville. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, Charlottesville, if you play the entire clip, oh, and this God. is terrible, we always put us <laughs> yeah. in the context of having to support and defend Donald Trump. If you play the entire clip mm. of Charlottesville and not excerpt it, Donald Trump was clearly talking about people who wanted to take down the statues. Mm. Yeah, not, but- not, so let's not get sidetracked to that. Joe Biden also called me a semi-fascist, whatever that is. And he also accused Georgia of Jim Crow too when they passed their election laws. So let's not pretend Joe Biden is some nice guy. No. He's not. Well, he hasn't he's, attempted he, a coup. So there's, they've got that. He's got well, that going for him. Well, <laughs> Nobody's charged the Capitol. So, well, hold on. Where, a does second. The, well, where does the vote go? Okay. But first, what was the Russia hoax? That oh, God. Oh, oh, man. Oh, okay. okay. That's go? enough. <laughs> what was the Russia yeah. hoax? That was a coup. So this is... These are the people we need to win over, Tom. I don't know. How oh, does yeah. that make you feel? Um, yeah, well, you know, Donald, Donald Trump need, uh, you know, as Nikki Haley so wisely told us, Donald Trump needs to, you know, win, make, win them over and other people outside the party. Uh, because, you know, he's an unknown quantity. I mean, this Donald Trump guy, he just burst on the scene here in 2024. And we're still kind of getting our reading on the guy. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, we really, he's got to introduce himself to the American people. I mean, this is all just, unbe- I mean, leave aside any partisan preference you might have for anyone to talk this way about Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. It's, it's, um, it's hallucinatory. It's as if nothing happened. It's, it's like, um, you know, I keep saying it's like the guy in Memento who keeps, who wakes up every morning and doesn't have any new memories and he has to start all over again, you know? Um, but the thing with, the, the other thing is this. Um, Maybe this we could write cat- a note next to Nikki Haley's bed with just kind of a list to, of a couple of things Trump has done. Don't trust this person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Little Polaroids, yeah. little little tattoos. Mitch McConnell is not your friend, <laughs> <Right>. you know. <laughs> 
Um, but, but this is a movie script that would write itself. But the I earn the vote <clears throat> thing, I'm glad that upset you as much as I did because it's like, what are you talk like? What are you talking about? Donald Trump could earn their vote, and like this guy being like, I've I've counted out Joe Biden, not considering him, but Donald Trump can win me back. It's like Donald Trump's not changing. Donald Trump is Donald Trump. He's been the same what for 60 like? years. Yeah, what is The that? minute she said that, I said, what does that look like? Okay, he's going to earn – he's he, what he's going to step forward and say, um, I'm sorry I've been a horrible person my whole life and I didn't mean to do a coup and I'm sorry about my, you know, uh, you know, many uh, offenses again against the – I mean, what, that doesn't it, – it, that's just, you know, sort of a boilerplate speech writing 101 you know as if again as if it's a normal election but i think what you're hearing and what you that whole clip from um mr levine is we know that once again the the ss gop has struck the trump iceberg yeah and and this is all about the it's like they there is now a desperate attempt underway and you know you and i've both been seeing it among our former friends on the right you know of saying well joe biden is so terrible that the republican part forget about trump we know he has problems but the republican party is the only vessel of salvation against this communist anti-semite um you know antifa loving i don't know you know iranian coddling whatever and and it's it's an obvious pro first of all they're all saying I, I mean i don't think it's coordinated but it's obviously the same piece of sheet music of save the party at all costs save the party save the party save the party and to do that you have to depict joe biden um you know who's about the most ordinary american politician i mean it's like again we need to define joe biden because you know no one's seen the guy for 50 years he just he's a brand new, you know, like all this stuff is said as if Joe Biden didn't exist 45 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, it's a name. It's well, all just why you got to bring in the name. other people. I mean, so you have to kind of create a fake Joe Biden. Right. And then, you know, when we're off air, this guy, Levine, is, is continues to shout at me and he's like, well, it's it's the Hamas kids on campus. It's the pro Hamas <laughs> kids on campus. He's like, they're Joe Biden voters. And I'm like, I don't like the pro I'm not I'm a Joe Biden voter. I'm not a pro Hamas. I was like Joe Joe Biden. What are you like? What are you talking about? Joe Biden has resisted these people. I thought I thought that the talking point up until like two minutes ago was that Joe Biden was a Trojan horse and he was senile and the far left was going to control him. It's like if that's the case, well, why isn't why wasn't Joe Biden out there chanting from the river to the sea? You know, right. with the pro right? like he's resisted that angle. Well, yeah, they, also, they I'm sorry, they, uh, you're worried about the Hamas kids on campus. Um, can we talk about the new nominee for governor of North Carolina? Right. I mean, or the guy you know, that had lunch with Donald Trump, Nick Fuentes, <laughs> who's like in the, the neo-Nazi and Kanye, like after his anti-Jew rant had lunch with Trump is, is Joe Biden inviting the students for Palestine to the white house. I haven't seen that. I mean, it's an easy call, uh, uh you know, I, and I wrote about it myself about campus anti-Semitism, yeah. which I think is, you know, uh, exists and it's insane and, and concerning. It's, it's a whole f and concerning and it's a whole weird thing unto itself. But I, I don't think people are having to post armed guards outside of synagogues because of college kids. Um, you know, the, there are, there are bad people who are anti-Semites, um, who want to do terrible things and somehow saying, well, this all, you know, sort of is, you know, Joe Biden is the sudden fountainhead of all this anti-Semitism. It's again, it's it's the rationalizations piling up. Oh, my God, Donald Trump is the nominee. How do I avoid the moral stain of Donald Trump being the nominee? And so now I have to develop all these alternative narratives about how, you know, Joe Biden is the leader of uh, a, a violent cult it, you know it's interesting when you tim when you said about um levine continuing to yell at you and you know joe biden directing the hamas kids and all of that he also told me it was my fault offstage it was like we're forcing him to go for trump by you well, know that's, being condescending, uh, that et cetera. we're up to our hips in that already yeah. look what you made me do yeah right um but uh but the, it's interesting that people now on the right because their movement is completely in the in the thrall to one man they can't imagine any other movement that isn't 
You know, they can't, right. they look, they look, at, they look at, at, you know, what's happening in the Democratic Party. They look at people like, you know, uh, the, I don't know, the former squad or Omar or the campus kids or whatever. And they say, well, our party is completely directed from the center, you know, by one unhinged, terrible human being. Theirs must be too, or at least I have to depict it that way uh, so that I can escape, again, this kind of dreadful moral stain. Yeah, and Eric, Eric Erickson wrote this. So you have, uh, you know, Dan McLaughlin at National View writes, in short, do you help Trump destroy the party or do you help Biden destroy the country? Uh, the country, uh, I guess that's another question we can get to, whether the country is destroyed. We have Eric Erickson uh, saying, remember all the people outraged by GOP selecting Trump are siding with the party that went all in with BLM, excuse riots and vandalism, dismisses shoplifting crimes, claims violence doesn't apply to property damage, and is now muted in response to left-wing anti-Semitism. Spare me your lectures. Again, I, wow. Again, it's like, I'm sorry, did Joe Biden do any of that? Like all of my well, complaints Joe about Biden Trump are things directed. that, yeah, right? It's Joe like, Biden clearly directed giant shoplifting rings in San Francisco, and it's um, like the, the election is not between the people stealing from Walgreens on Market Street in San Francisco and Donald Trump. That's not who the right. election is between. It's between Joe well, Biden if, and Donald Trump. But you have to make it between those two to create exactly. a moral equivalence. Exactly, because again, you know, part of what you're trying to, and this is. Imagine the agony of these folks, you know, 2016, 2020, and now 2024, that, you, you know, you're basically just scrubbing and scrubbing um, to get, again, to get that moral stain off of you. And um, the way you do it now is to say, everybody is so awful, you know, and, and Joe Biden is the leader of an anti, I mean, if you, you get talking with, uh, you know, guys like Eric Senator McLaughlin and it becomes, you know, uh, well, the Democrats are enemies of the Constitution as well. Well, I, OK, you know, Democrats, I've had my I've had my share of uh, gripes about Democrats and congressional and, and uh, presidential overreach. But I, I haven't seen any coups lately. I mean, we we keep forgetting that it's like, well, on the one side, we have a, um, a guy who tried to violently who instigated the violent overthrow of of the constitutional order. And on the other side, we have some very bad public policy that's resulted in some shoplifting and homelessness and some college kids, you know, being all bitched out about the middle East. Well, that those are not comparable, but they have to be, I wanted to get to one other thing before we lose it. When you started saying, um, you know, is, is the country really on the brink of disaster? I wrote yesterday or two days ago, I'm, see, I'm old. I'm losing track of my days. Dude, say uh, some Sometime in the past. I texted my husband um, yesterday, did you forget to take our daughter to School of Rock? And he was like, that was two days ago, bro. Like, what are you talking <laughs> exactly. about? Exactly. It's like the old Stephen Wright joke. So just the other day. No, wait, it was three years ago. Uh, so um, I wrote that if you would strip Biden's name off of the current three-year record of an incumbent president and handed it to any voter, that's a formidable record for a candidate of either party. I mean, that that I, I, I say, you know, just as a political scientist, I will say that rather as, as, a, as a scholar of politics rather than as a, you know, an opinion guy. I mean, it's just there is no way around it that if you took all of these things, took all of the economic data, took where we are in foreign policy, uh, you would say not perfect, you know, OK, fine, but. A pretty solid first term. I, I said probably one of the most consequential and successful first terms since Reagan. And and yet somehow this has turned into, you know, uh, these guys are all like, you know, Madame Defarge with, you know, the, the blood running in the, in the streets of Paris. And, and it's 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 nonsense. But I think it shows you how desperate they are to get out from under what I just, what just happened on Tuesday. I just kind of wonder, like, how do these people get through a day? Like they're bad, they're, 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 that, they're, yeah. they're, bad, they're bad choices in life all the time, right? <laughs> Where you're like, oh, what do I do? Like, okay, there's bad traffic. All right. Like, do I go sit in traffic or do I wait in the office for an extra hour? Both choices I have complaints about, but like, you have to pick one. You know what I mean? Like, I'm hungry. I, I didn't, I forgot to go grocery shopping. Like, should I, should, should I order food? Which Thanks, should, Biden. Like, like, what, <laughs> like, how do these people fucking go through that? Yeah, sure. I, the fine. You, I have complaints with Biden. Everybody, like, no president is going to be perfect. I didn't like the Afghanistan withdrawal either. But it's like, I, I don't understand that you can't look at two options and say, uh, you know, and I think Biden's been, been frankly fine. But even if you think Biden has been bad, even if you would grade him as D, 
how many times in life do you have to make choices like this where you look at two options and one of them is an F, one of them is potentially catastrophic for you, and the other one's like not that great. Like that that I, happens every week for people. Uh, you know, this isn't But having got, this argument since 2016. It's like, well, the Democrats will put in some policies I don't like. Yes, I agree. They're going to put in some bad policies. They will. I wrote about this back in 2016. I said the Democrats are going to do things. They're going to make my head explode and they're going to piss me off. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't like. On the other hand, the Constitution, (laughs) you know, and I, I, I just I think it's such an artificial discussion about this whole, you know, this. I mean, it is gaslighting about, well, the you know, the Democrats are, um, you know, dangers of the Constitution and Joe Biden runs Antifa. And I wondered the same thing the other day. I was thinking about this and I thought, how do you how do you write something like that? And then, you know, at the end of the day, you kind of lay in there and say, did I did I say that knowing full well how completely cuckoo pants that, you know, bananas that is. Um, but I think, again, there is this kind of. I mean, look, you and I were Republicans. We know that party loyalty, um, you know, is is um, the the totem at the center of the Republican Party. And I think that's what's killing it now. Okay, well, that's a nice transition into another clip I wanted to play you. Speaking of party loyalty being at the totem, um, here's a majority uh, minority leader, excuse me, uh, Mitch McConnell yesterday. Can we listen to Mitch? How do you reconcile your Trump endorsement with the fact that you called him practically and morally responsible for January 6th and and the fact that he insulted you and your wife repeatedly? On February the 25th, 2021, shortly after the attack on the Capitol, I was asked a similar question. And I said I would support the nominee for president, even if it were the former president. Leader McConnell, in April of last year, you indicated, didn't really directly answer the question as to whether or not you were comfortable with Mr. Trump if he was in the middle of criminal trials and indictments, he was the nominee. I presume that means you're comfortable with him. I, I don't have anything to add to what I just said. I said in February of 2021, shortly after the attack on okay. the Capitol. That's enough. The ultimate team player, the ultimate team player calls your wife Coco Chow, (laughs) making a racist Asian attack on his wife and uh, is responsible for an attack on the Capitol. And yet he looks at us just like, well, what am I going to do? What I can you explain this one to me? Because I got to tell you, Nikki, Haley, like some of these other people, Marco, I don't defend them. I don't excuse it, but I get it. They have future who knows what the future holds? Mitch McConnell is an old man who who like stroked out earlier this year. He's retiring. He's not going to lobby. It's not like he's going to K Street. Like, what is why? Why not? Why not just say it? Why not just say, you know what? I've known Joe Biden for 50 years. We've disagreed on a lot of things, but there's never nobody's gonna storm the Capitol and he's never gonna make fun of my wife. So I'm gonna be with Joe Biden. Why not do that? How hard is that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know. <laughs> There was that uh, moment during an interview where Lindsey Graham blurted out that Joe Biden's one of the nicest guys on God's green earth, you know, um, and that he's known him for years. And of course, you know, immediately had to. But but when I said that, I meant, you know, one of the most horrible, you know, (laughs) leprous, uh, you know, I I think, um, first of all, with the other guys, you talk about their future, you know, Marco Rubio's future and Nikki Haley's future. <clears throat> that future is they cannot envision just going back to being something else right. that I think that's just part of it with Mitch. I don't even know. I don't, I mean, I, that's, there's just a, when, I suppose when you, you know, it's, he's a member in Shawshank, the Shawshank redemption where uh, Brooks, the guy with the bird, James Whitmore, he's okay. the old guy. And he, he's an institution man. He says, you know, that he doesn't even what doesn't even know how to live on the outside of the institution. And a lot of these guys are like uh, Brooks. That was the character. They're like Brooks. They they can't live outside. Don't know know how to go to the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't they can't function, you know, outside of the institution. They've been in it so long. And I think that's, you know, in part, they come to love being at Shawshank. You know, they want to go back. 
Um, they'd rather live in prison the rest of their, I don't, I don't know. That's all I can think. I, every time I see somebody like McConnell, I think of, you know, poor old James Whitmore saying, you know, on the outside saying, I don't like it here. You know, <laughs> I want to go back. I, you know what I think? I think it could be worse than that. I think that there are, the, there are people around him that want to be involved more and are advised pushing in this. Way. Cause here's the thing. If there was, could one person get Mitch McConnell didn't talk to me, but I wonder if one person could get to Mitch McConnell. It's too late now, but could have in the last three years and said, you know what, Mitch, you're an institutionalist. If you had held the line beginning in January 2021 and said, nope, I need to protect this institution. They've shit on the Capitol. They stormed the Capitol. They stormed my office. I need to defend this. The institution of the Senate is more important to me. That's why I went to the mattresses on the filibuster. And guess what? I will not waver on this one. I will not. And they kicked him out. That They might rename one of those buildings after him, right? That's yeah, the thing that you get a building named after you for. You still get to hang out. He still gets to hang out. Chuck, Joe Biden, have him over to the White House. According to Evan Osnos, Joe Biden calls him. He'd still, he would be in, he'd be in perfect situation. Yeah, he, he would have gotten his Supreme Court and he would be a legend. Why not do that? Yeah, except, except that the, the, the culture of the Senate where other guys are coming to him and saying, Mitch, I can't, we can't convict Donald Trump. I have to go home to, you know, my cherry red state yeah. and I'm getting threatening phone calls and the culture, you know, it's, they love the guys like McConnell and Collins, they love the institution of the Senate. But part of that institutional love is that you protect the guys in the club. And some of that, I think, is just they McConnell. Dis- giving. They were in danger, though. I'm physical danger. I hear you. I know. Uh, I know you. But agree, you know, yeah. it's top cover for. Yeah, they were in danger. But you know what? They they feel safer living in Washington than they do among their own constituents. That's and true. they'd rather be senators. And I think that in the end, you know, all of these people, these electeds that we're talking about, are like, I would rather be. I mean, Elise Stefanik. Do you think Elise Stefanik doesn't know that the things she's saying are completely bonkers? Of course she does. Um, of course she does. You know, t- Ted Cruz. Um, yeah, but Rubio, they, they, they didn't have know. any hope for the statue. Mitch could have got a statue. Mitch was on the cusp of having a statue, and they, the people didn't. Did I not, think, or, that, you don't I think, think so? that's a misunderstanding of McConnell. I think his day, he's like, I was the, his, he, he, if you had said to him, Mitch, there will be no statues, but you can serve as the majority leader until the day you die, he'd have said, sold. So, yeah. I don't know. It's just these guys. He has this reputation. This is the other thing that it's just these guys are so weak. It's the one thing that Trump is right about and is so pliable. Like Mitch has this reputation as he's this hard ass, you know, yeah. and all of his little advisors that are around him. They have another podcast. They call it Ruthless. We're ruthless. Mitch <laughs> McConnell is tough. And it's like some fucking, you know, two bit reality show host and real estate guy starts calling his wife names. And like, we'll see how tough he is. He's out there on he's out just out there standing in front of the press. Well, I just got to do what I got to do. You know, yeah. that's not ruthless. That's not ruthless. No, and, you that's, know, you bring up staff. And I wonder I, I wonder if that's a part of it, too, that, you know, that there are people the same reason that when some when there were people saying, you know, hey, McConnell's clearly, you know, doing that that freeze thing, yeah. you know, and the issues that he had of people or for Feinstein. Let's be bipartisan about it. Diane yeah, Feinstein, sure. right? Saying, no, no, we're going to keep her in that chair because I'm a staffer and I need a job. And this is. You know, I mean, a meal ticket. I, w- I was a staffer to, 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 to a state level and a federal level politician. And, you know, you only exist um, as, you know, the samurai for your for your lord. You know, once your guy is gone, you're you're back on the street. So maybe some of this is just being driven by staff saying, hey, let's not you know, I need to I need to live in Republican world after you're gone, boss. Um, yeah. but I mean, I, I think the cowardice is just, it's, it's, um, it's hard to explain it, it's, it, it's, you know, I suppose if we understood it, we wouldn't be doing this, the OG never Trumpers yeah. that we were for eight years. I guess, so. you know, I just live in a fantasy world where someday I just wish that, you know, when they're putting in the new pool at their house, that they're thinking like, you know, what paid for this pool? The fact that I let Donald Trump just demean <laughs> Elaine Chow. That's that's what paid for this pool. Anyway, I guess probably they probably don't think about that. Okay, um, I want to go to the other side of the hill. Uh, 
Actually, before we get to Mike Johnson, um, I would like to uh, I'd like to trigger you one more time uh, on the topic of uh, being able to. Why decide. you do this to me, Demi? Um, <laughs> I would like to read to you a uh, a quote from Mickey Stout, age eighty, in Richmond. She was a Nikki Haley voter. Did you hear? Did uh, you see her? I know where this is going. I think Trump. I want to get to Mike Johnson. I want to get to actual policy next, but I want to do one more on this. I think Trump is so irrational and really very frightening. I think that if he allowed this January 6th thing to take place, he could try to take over the next time if he doesn't win this one. I just think he's dishonest, and I don't want that. But I think Biden is too, voice trails off, well, I definitely won't vote for Biden. I will have to vote for Trump. Mickey Stout, two-time Trump voter, Richmond, Virginia. Lucky Virginia is not a swing state. (laughs) Mickey isn't. Mickey doesn't want to be in the club. Mickey is a nice old lady in a little red sweater here uh, with an American flag. Kind of, what do you call that? A kerchief? It is, a, it is an immense triumph of uh, messaging from Fox and yeah. uh, from the right wing e- media ecosystem that has made old people deathly afraid of a, of a politician that has been part of their life for a half century. Yeah. Uh and 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 can bring them i mean it is a remarkable kind of ability to bring people to a very clear state of knowledge that say donald trump's very dangerous he's dishonest if he tries to get in he'll do another january 6th she literally says this yeah. and then says but i'll have to vote for him again and you know i've had these conversations with people where i say what is it that's going on that you think well, crime's out of control. Well, no, it isn't. Um, well, the border's out of control. Yeah, it is. And, you know, everybody agrees that, that of course, J- Trump trashed a bipartisan. But OK, um, the world's on fire. Yes. And who's been holding that together? You know, and you kind of yeah. walk them through it. And the, you eventually get to the point, And this has happened to me in discussions with people where I say, well, I just don't think that's true. I feel like this is maybe your space, uh, more respect for elders. But I feel like maybe we lost... The, de- the the deceased generation of folks that, like lived through the Spanish flu and the de- Great Depression and stuff, maybe losing that. Maybe there's like not a sense of how bad things could be, right? Like well, I, if Fox you're... has convinced these people that things are horrible, that everything's out of control, and they don't have like a, you know, they, they don't have like a, a, a a reference point to go back to and be like, well, are they that out of control? I mean, I remember when things were really out of control. Well, that's it. I'm old enough to, you know, I'm old enough to remember that as well. And, and it kind of blows my mind because if you're 80 today, um, you were, let's say a form, let's say, you know, as you were going into the last of your working years, you know, starting around 50 or 55, that was the nineties. It's not like, and I think the problem is that you have, that your 30 year horizon has largely been, and I wrote about this in my last book, ding, 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 book, book plug, but in, in our own worst enemy, I said, you know, this has been <clears throat> such a long stretch of peace and prosperity and rapidly achieving living standards that um, it's easy to convince people that things are terrible just by showing them stuff constantly. I was watching the news last night. I'm I, I, I'm not being cute about which network. I genuinely don't remember which network. But it was a report about crime and why crime is down. And yet the two hooks in the story were National Guard of the New York subways and um, um, a shooting in Philadelphia. So the message you took away from this news story was that it's it's escape from New York. I mean, right. it's, you know, yeah. Snake Plissken yeah. is roaming the streets. Um, even though the, the, the verbal, the narrative top line was crime is actually down. And I think people just don't have any memory of the 60s or the 70s anymore. And uh, I don't know what to do about that. Yeah, me neither. Okay. I, um, well, maybe. I'm gonna, this is going to be my main theme of the year. Just I know that people don't like to hear it, but like, things are okay. Like things are okay. Things can get worse. Tail risk. I want to end with the thing on tail risk. But before that, we got to get back to Mike Johnson. I was against the defund the police program. How about you? That was a bad idea, you thought? I assume we agreed on <laughs> well, that. Well, no, well, I, I was against it until Joe Biden told us we all had to be in favor of it. So, oh, did you know, Joe, because, was Joe Biden for you weren't, weren't you at the Antifa meeting? You know, that's the thing, Tim. You never come to meetings. Um, 
But no, of course I was. I, my, my brother and my father were both cops to fund the police. I was one of the people like you standing on the side saying, please stop please saying stop this, doing this idiotic okay. thing. So let's hear Mike Johnson. Yeah. Let's see what Mike Johnson has, has is bragging about this week. Can we play that clip? We also advanced, as you've seen the summary, uh, cuts to some of the agencies that we believe are really overreaching and, and have been turned in some ways against the American people. Wow. Um, we, we're going to cut uh, 3% from DOJ, 7% from the ATF, 6% from the FBI, FBI. And 10% from the EPA. And that's just a start. We have a lot more priorities and things that we need to advance. DO, <laughs> DOJ, ATF, and FBI. What do they do? What do those, what do those <laughs> agencies do, Tom? What are we defunding Tim, there? Tim, come on. They're, they oppress the rights of ordinary citizens. <laughs> I mean, come, Wait, I thought, you know, that, I thought is that, that, these, that is the same thing that the left said about local cops. They oppress the rights you know, of ordinary I mean, citizens. That's just, well. And also it's where, again, if you're of a certain age, it's what the left said about the FBI. Right. I mean, I've, I've, I'm now, you know, I was a teenager in the 1970s and the early, and then, you know, I became a voting age. I turned 20 in 1980. And I, I feel like this is de, deja vu, you know, that, that this is where, that the far right has, has now become where the far left was of, you know, the FBI is dangerous. ATF is there to just, you know, hassle people. The DOJ is a nest of, you know, um, agent Smiths that are out to, you know, destroy. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's nuts. And, and, um, but again, it, it's in a, in a time when you can't find, um, really defining differences between the parties about, um, you know, a, a crisis, I mean, the immigration is probably the closest you get to it, but it's not 1968 where you really are making a hard decision about law and order or, you know, riots in the cities literally burning, you know, and, and I don't mean small towns where there's a, a riot. I mean like Los Angeles, Newark, Detroit right. in flames, you know? Um, and uh, you just are, if you, if you don't have those stark choices, you make them up and you say, well, I, you know, this is, I mean, I'm waiting for Mike Johnson. I'm, this is going to be a deep cut from the Cold War. I'm waiting for Mike Johnson to say he's finally going to put an end to COINTELPRO or something, you know, and go the full Chomsky. I mean, uh, but seriously, I mean, we are. We're pro-Russia. We're pro well, things. The gro Russian grocery stores are great. You know, I mean, we, we, I just, I don't mean literally you and me, we, but I mean, we like the Repu the Republicans, that's what they're saying. The, the Tucker is out there. The things are great in Russia. We're cutting for the police. I, why can't, I don't, maybe Biden needs to do better at this. Maybe it's just too counterintuitive to get into people's heads, but like as a literal matter, the Democrats are fighting the Russians. The Democrats are not, maybe not at the prosecutory level, but at the federal level are increasing funding for, for law enforcement. And the Republicans are on the side of Russia and on the side of defunding the police. That is just a fact. It's, That's just a fact of what's you, happening right now. They're killing me, Smalls, because, you know, I, again, being a Cold Warrior, uh, I'm going to go all Mo Green. I made my bones during the Cold War, you know. <laughs> um, but during the Cold War, I, I, I was one of those happy warriors saying, you know, you weak need pro-Russia, Kremlin-fearing, Democratic, liberal, NATO-hating, anti-defense, you know, because in the early, those of us that were young Reagan voters, that was the kind of argument we had. Right. Now, I watch Tucker, I was thinking of this when he was doing his supermarket thing, and he's like a parody of, he's like an SNL parody of the most left-wing PBS documentary from like 1981. You know, it's like Ronald Reagan says they're terrible, but here in a Russian grocery, in a Soviet grocery store, the borscht is flowing, right. you know, <laughs> and it's, I, I mean, I'm like, I can't even believe what I'm watching um, and living in the world I live in where the Democrats are, you know, planting the flag for NATO. They're sending weapons to a country under Russian. Th I mean, basically, the Democrats are, are doing a modern version of the Reagan doctrine. And the people who hate it the most claim to be, you know, Reagan Republicans. Yeah. Like my friend, Mr. Levine. What, speaking of which, so we have um, the State of the Union tonight. Um, we'll be talking about that all day tomorrow. But is there anything, like, what, forget, do you have any advice? Oh, for the State of the Union? Yeah. Because I was, yeah, I, don't forget, we were going to talk about Katie Porter. Oh, too. we're going to get there. We got, I got oh, State right, of the okay. Union. I got Katie Porter and I've got one I, last thing you know, for you. I'm not done being triggered. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> here's what I think is going to happen on the State of the Union. Joe Biden is going to come in. People are going to shake his hand. The Republicans are going to sit there and glower. 
Biden is going to stumble over a few words. He's going to read a little too fast. Um, and he's going to have a couple of moments that people are going to say, boy, he sounds old. And the substance will be lost um, because it will just be yet another of, you know, did the State of the Union, I, I, I'll i write the headline now. There will be somebody who says, did the State of the Union later rest concerns about Biden's age? Yeah, I know. It's for, I, I know you can't do this. It'll be interesting. We'll, we'll be going deeper on this tomorrow, so I, I don't want to belabor the point. But I, I sort of just wish he could have go, go in there and just pick two things and just be like, we're just going to talk about two things right now. Like, we're, we're going to talk about the democratic threat and we're going to talk about how I've put a proposal on the table to fund Ukraine, to stand with our allies and to secure the border. Will the Republicans mm-hmm. do it? This is it. You got to do it. We got to, I got to put pressure on it. And that and would kind would of force everybody. Because I do think he's going to talk about those things. And I think that he's on the right side of those things. But but it's like, how do you focus the conversation around it for the people that aren't watching it? You know, I, I would love to have him walk in again, as you say, instead of a big I hate these State of the Union addresses where, you know, they're this big smorgasbord laundry of, of laundry. Li- yeah, big, you know, aspirational wish list of things that I wish I could do to say, look, we are in a very you know, this is a very dark time for democracy around the world and even here in the United States. Here are the two things that I really want done. I want to get this bipartisan border deal done. I want to fund the budget and I want to help our friends overseas defend their freedom. But and the Republicans turn, are against all of those things. And the Republicans are against all of them. And I want to turn to my Republican friends in the chamber. And many of you are my friends. Right. And you know you are. We've known each other for a long time. But your nominee is now telling you to do dangerous things. And I'm asking you to be legislators, to work with me. Um, you know, whatever happens in 2025, that's that's that'll happen when it happens. But until then, we have work to do. And the leader of your party, you know, does, is not shouldn't be controlling this from outside the building. Be, you know, stand man up. And I, that's just not going to happen, right. unfortunately. Yeah, I agree. I hope we get some of that at least um, amidst the laundry list. Okay, uh, I got two minute hate on Katie Porter, and then and then one more serious topic for you, and then uh, you know people can enjoy their Thursday. Uh, Katie Porter, for people who missed it, uh, she she got absolutely trounced by Adam Schiff uh, in the California Senate race. I think it's kind of understated, by the way, that Schiff took a more of a bite. I know that again, going back to Eric Levine about how the Democrats are abandoning Israel. Schiff took a, a more you know, a, a middle of the road approach on the, on the Israel question, where it's kind of Katie Porter uh, lashed, you know, lashed out and kind of took more of the lefty approach on that. Katie Porter loses substantially. P- Porter plus Barbara Lee, so the progressive, if you will, vote share in this California Senate first round runoff did not even come. I think together they were 21 and and Schiff is like 36. So it's not even close. Like the, the race isn't even close. Anyway, her statement. Thank you to everyone who supported our campaign and voted to shake up the status quo in Washington. Because of you, we had the establishment running scared, I guess, withstanding three to one in TV spending and an onslaught of billionaires spending millions to rig this election. Rig is what she said. Then this morning, she tried to, to correct herself by saying that by rigged, she meant manipulated by dishonest means. I don't think that helped much. <laughs> oh, that's better. Yeah. I didn't I didn't mean cheat. I meant not follow the rules. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, look, you know, I, I, I don't want it to be a two minutes hate on Katie Porter, but I hope Katie Porter now understands that, you know, when you say things like rig, when somebody has been running for the past five years saying all elections are basically rigged, except the ones I win, you know, you're not helping. Um, you know, you got outspent three to one. Well, welcome to the real world of politics where, you know, uh, sometimes you get outspent. And, and by the way, people, I hope people understand that getting outspent does not mean that you always lose. Hillary Clinton outspent Donald Trump. Yeah. That did not go well. So did Jeb, by the way. I was on that one. So did Ron DeSantis, by the way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, Ron DeSantis is, I mean, that's a, that's a bonfire. That's a joker lighting the pallet of money on fire moment. Um, you know, that, that is going to be tough to equal anywhere in modern America. This happened. I wrote about this this morning for, in the morning shots newsletter. This happened in these house races where you had Ken Griffin and these big money donors on the right that came in and in, in these deep red districts and tried to support 
like kind of pretend MAGA candidates against real mm. MAGA candidates, right? And they all got they all got swamped right? because the vote because the Republican voters wanted the MAGA freak shows. They wanted Dinesh D'Souza's son-in-law, who's like an election truther. Like that's what they wanted. And so, if I, again, money helps, but especially in these high-profile races, if California voters wanted what Katie Porter was selling, they, then she wouldn't have gotten fourteen percent, or you know, or Barbara Lee, or. I mean, you know, the, part of the problem with the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is they really have not, and, and this I think does uh, undermine a lot of what what Joe Biden's been trying to do in the campaign. But I think a lot of people in the progressive wing of the party just haven't internalized what a minority of the of the country they are. In the same way that the MAGA folks who are always like, "We're the silent majority. We're the people. We're the real Americans." The the, the MAGA movement is actually a pretty limited minority of people. They just have outsized influence because of the structure and, and culture of the Republican Party and because of primaries. Right. Um, you know, but so when you're, you know, when you lose 20 points to a well-known, because nothing wrong with Katie Porter. She, you know, I watched her in Congress, she, hardworking member of Congress, you know, don't agree with her on a lot of stuff. But when you lose by 20 points, you don't, you, you shouldn't be throwing around words like rigged. That's just that that is that's horseshoe politics. That's where the far right and the far left touch uh, that, you know, all elections are rigged. And, and so while not two minutes hate, let's have a two You're minutes right. of that's, come on, Katie. That was good, not the right. That's, thing that's a good say. correction. Thank you. Two yeah. minutes of come on, Katie, please. So let's yeah. stop with the rigged. OK, final topic. Uh, again, I also don't want this to be a hate hate because I got nothing. Um, I, I, I got nothing to respect for my friend Jonah Goldberg of the people at the Dispatch. We had Jamie Weinstein on this podcast. If you missed it, I thought it was a really good conversation. We we explored some of our dif- differences, but this newsletter yesterday, I wanted to get your take on. Basically says, let me skip ahead. Five years from now, America will be okay. You'll probably be okay, and if you're not okay, it will in all likelihood have nothing to do with who is elected president in 2024. And I, 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 there's a, there's a part of me that, that agrees with that. I'm not a doomer. I, I, I think that probably we could survive another Trump term. We survived one, but I, I just, the, the, I just, I, I think that there is a epidemic right now of people <clears throat> that are just not willing to just accept tail risk and understand mm. the elements of tail risk. And I, I look at this and say, like I, I read that and I was like, you know, I, I guess one part of me says, okay, I hear what you're trying to say. The other part of me says, if even if there's only a 5% chance that Donald Trump gets in power and then uses, uses violence, you know, you, you know, to stay in power or, or, or literally rigs, you know, the system to stay in power. Like if there's even a 5% chance of that, like that's, that's insanely too high. A one like, like since, yeah. since World War II, well, we've never had a one percent chance where one of the major candidates might literally end democracy. And so, so this is where I get frustrated with kind of that attitude, which is a more, which is more mainstream. I told which which I re- respect more than like the Eric Erickson stuff we were talking about at the top. But I just I think still think it's a fundamentally flawed, you know, uh, logic. It's um, there's a couple of things going on. One is a normalcy bias which is a normal normalcy bias is the idea that <clears throat> nothing could really change that much. It's just, it's the same shock when you, you have a life trauma, right? You, one day you're living your life and then suddenly you're hit by a car and you're crippled or you're, you have a right. cancer diagnosis or you go broke or you lose your job or something. It's just unimaginable until the point that it's actually happening. Right. Um, right. You don't live your life. There's an old joke, the comedian who says, uh, hey, I like to live every day like it's my last. Wake up, call my lawyer, write the will, call the funeral home, buy a coffin. Right. You know, nobody lives that way. Right. Um, the problem with the normalcy bias is that there's an element of truth in it. I mean, look, I live in New England. Life in New England, we have, you know, a prime, we have blue. We are for all the talk about how, you know, wild eyed lefties you know, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. I mean, I live in the one of the most Catholic states in the union. I mean, we are a strange combination of, you know, progressivism and old school, um, you know, Catholic machine politics. You know, it's that my life will not change that much. But if Donald Trump becomes president and uses force and changes the, the DOJ, life's going to change a lot, especially for women, for people of color, for LGBT, uh, you know, people. 
immigrants and in places not like Massachusetts, but in Alabama and in Wyoming and in potentially, you know, Texas or other places the the country won't. And if fall. it's a blowout, maybe Massachusetts, by the way, I mean, <laughs> you know, what I, yeah. if they end up having if they like Republicans, this is always my thing on the filibuster. Republicans could win a trifecta this year. It's not impossible. It's like not it's impossible not impossible. And they could kill it's, the filibuster. <clears throat> And they and this can is make a, federal laws that do apply. But this to is a states. great thing about about you know uh, again when going back to our you know previous Republican days, isn't it nice to see liberals rediscovering the joys of federalism? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's yeah. like Amen. you know something we were banging the gong Snaps. about you know thirty years ago, right? Yeah. You know about hey hey you know it's good to have state legislatures that do their own thing, yeah. you know. Um, so, but I think that when people talk about you know Trump will end democracy, it's it's not all going to end. The day he's inaugurated, it will fall in a patchwork of, uh, of you know, like, like it's like infrastructure collapse, right? It's not like the whole air traffic system shuts down and all the roads become undrivable. Bridges start collapsing here and there, uh, a plane crash here and there, water pollution here and there until, you know, finally one thing after another. And then you find out that, yeah, the infrastructure has collapsed. You are living in a, in a, you know, dangerous country. Um, the, and I think that the people that are making this point about say, Oh, five years from now, you'll be fine. Five years from now, God willing, um, that was me knocking on wood five years from now, I'll be 68 years old. I'll probably be retired for the second time in my life. You know, I'm already collecting a pension. Um, and I live, you know, near the beach in super blue southern New England. Okay, fine. I'll probably be okay. That doesn't mean the country's going to be okay. That doesn't, that's, it's, it's a meaningless thing to say you personally, you know, a, a white male of means will be okay. That's a meaningless statement about, the, about democracy. Yeah. And it also, I think, to your point about the patchwork, like the, or, you can just look at Orban. Right. Like, again, the example, like, like in their heads, I, I guess I think you're kind of batting down a straw man where people are saying, well, it's not going to if Trump wins, it's not going to be Nazi Germany. It's like, yeah, it's probably not going to be Nazi Germany if Trump wins. I, I think that it seems like there's going to be mass deportations if Trump wins. So there's going to be some really bad outcomes for folks that are being deported. But what really is like a much higher percent than like a much higher chance than 5% of total democratic collapse, which is possible is this, is this soft democratic collapse stuff that you've written about, you know, you wrote recently like democracy's dark winter, you know, Trump's autocratic tirade, look at his proposals. It looks a lot more like what's happening in Hungary where it's not like overnight people woke up in, uh, you know, in Hungary and were like, Oh, I, like my life really changed dramatically from yesterday to today, but slowly there's an erosion. Of, but over of, the years, it has. Yeah. If you start from where Hungary was, you know, ten or fifteen or twenty years ago, and look at it now, that's that's when you kind of step back and say, "Wow, you know, it's kind of like, I guess, the two metaphors, right? It's like um, if they're." It's like watching someone grow up, right? That, you know, you, you see them when they're kids and then you run into them when they're 18 and say, wow, how did that happen? I wasn't looking, you know. Right. But I think the when it comes to the erosion of democratic norms, I think of sandcastles. And, you know, the beach, I, I live near a beach, so maybe I think of this. The beach comes in and kind of washes a little of it away, but it's still there, you know, and you kind of fix it and the tide comes in again and washes a little more. Away. And then, you know, an hour later, you're like, hey, I, there was a sandcastle here. Yeah. And, and it just happened one little wave at a time. That's how it will happen. And I, this is partly just to be, you know, to make sure that our bipar our hate is bipartisan and our curmudgeonliness and our anger is bipartisan. This is why I really um, have a burr in my saddle about the resistance. You know, like these are people in berets escorting down flyers to the channel. You know, give me a goddamn break. Um, it, you know, it's, it's not, you're not living in occupied territory. This is something that's going to happen in, in these kind of gradual erosions of your freedoms that are going to be. So I, I, the one place I will say it's fast and where I'm, let me just be, you know, epistemically humble about this and say, sure. the one place I didn't think it would happen was reproductive rights, yep. which really did happen fast. It, but again, spread out throughout the country. I mean, you know, the the situation of reproductive rights in Massachusetts is not the same as in Alabama, but it'll, as you say, it can happen and it is happening. Um, but I think the rest of that democratic collapse happens much more. Gra it's a frog boiling. It's sandcastles. It's frogs. It's metaphors. 
that I will run out of if I keep talking. So, um, Tom Nichols, your most recent one, um, right? So it's time to end the election, wish casting, everything's at stake in the Atlantic. People should go check it out. Um, your work in the Atlantic has been awesome, brother. I'm jealous, uh, of, uh, of your thanks, output man. and, uh, I hope you'll come back again soon. I appreciate it. The people love you. Thanks, man. Good All to right. be with you. All right. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition. Do a little state of the union recap. We'll see y'all then.